Good morning and uh, welcome to Race Industry Now, the weekly webinar series from EPAR Trade, presented to you by ARP, Performance Plus Global Logistics, Ferrea, Peak, Choir, and Fifth Third Bank Motorsports. I am Francis Savinien, the founder and CEO of EPAR Trade, the racing industry, every minute, every day. This is episode 470, and we're going to be traveling to the UK and talk with DSPS Engineering. With me this morning are Judy Kin, the co-founder of ePartrade, our three-time NASCAR co chief champion, the one and only Mr. Jeff Hammond. Judy? Thank you, Francis, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's hard to believe we have one more week of a technical webinar next week. We're already scheduling well into 2025. That just blows me away. But if anybody has missed any of our webinars this year or of our 470, we have them all in a full library on this platform. So log in, it's right there at the top. They're all there to be enjoyed. Um, Jeff? <laughs> I'm getting ready to say, uh, the idea, 470 of these, 2025, and, you know, you're talking about moving on. I mean, welcome to the racing world. I mean, that's what goes on. I mean, it's it's that way. It never stops, folks. And I think that's the reason, reason why, you know, every minute, every day, uh, we're trying to stay ahead and stay caught up and, and learn about what's what's new as far as technology is concerned today. Uh, we're going to get an opportunity to meet, I think, a gentleman that can educate us a lot about their product at DSPS and Perry. I'm real excited about, you know, getting an opportunity to see what you're going to show us today. It's great to be uh, taking a kind of like a little trip and, and doing a little, uh, you know, across the pond situation. So welcome and uh, let's get this ball rolling. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Francisque and Judy. Uh, how are you, Jeff? I'm doing well, sir. How about you? I mean, yeah. how's the weather over in England right now? We got a beautiful fall day here in the Carolinas, sunshine, you know, real mild temperatures and uh, getting ready to head to Florida for a race in the truck series, as well as the uh, Xfinity and uh, Cup before the thing's all said and done. Well, I remember visiting North Carolina in the, you know, 90s and the 2000s or the noughties, and the weather was amazing. Um, here it's kind of a winter's day. And the rain's trying to get through real hard. And I reckon it's going to succeed at some point fairly soon. But other than that, we're all alive, we're all healthy, and that's what counts. You know, I know that uh, you, I think you got a PowerPoint presentation you want to share with us. Yeah. Before we do, before we do that, you know, I want to ask you a couple of questions. And those of you who are uh, tuning in, I call it, or, you know, who are listening to our webinar here today. Don't forget, if you got questions, get them to us. We'd love to be able to get Perry to answer them for you. And uh, and we will not interrupt anything you got going on until you feel like it's a good time to take a breath. If it's halfway through or whatever, if not, we'll answer them at the end of the day. Okay? Does that work for you, Perry? All okay. right. I, one of the questions I want to ask you because of the technology that you folks are dealing with every day and the the quality of the racing that you are involved in is just unbelievable. You know, IndyCar, you know, you race gut product at Le Mans. Uh, it's, it's really quite incredible. Formula One. What drives progress and innovation as far as your company's concerned? Um, you know, the customer actually, because okay. the big deal, the, the big deal about quality is giving the customer what they expect. At, at the end of the day. And I think it's the customer and the competitor. You're always trying to beat the competitor. You're always trying to please your customer. So looking at what the competitor's doing, how do you go faster than them? How do you do it quicker? How do you do it less expensively, if that's possible? Not compromising reliability, of course. But um, a lot of what we do is driven by the customer. Um, you know, they tell us what they want. It depends how they're tuning their engines. You know, do they have any particular requirements? So the quality that we, you know, the quality and the product is driven mainly by the customer, secondly, by the competition. And then there's always this desire to do the best you can anyway. Okay. Well, that being said, though, which one, you know, is is the, is more, which one do you think is more important? Is, is there any difference between the customer and the competition? 
I mean, or, or is it something that you do internally as far as what you're looking for? Is it your, con your I mean, how do you say it? Your desire to improve, improve your product ahead of those folks. Oh, it's always a desire to improve the product ahead of the folks. You want to get out. You always want to be a leader if you can. Um, it's more difficult being a leader than a, you know, a chaser as it is. But um, yeah, if you can get out ahead, you know, you get a little advantage until the others catch up and then you just keep on, keep on improving. So that's, that's a lesson that, you know, was taught in all forms of racing right down from grassroots racing all the way up to professional level. Um, as long as you can do something a little bit better than your competitor and keep on doing that day after day, then, then you'll be okay. And there's a healthy degree of failure in all of that. It has to be said, not everything we do, you know, is a success because if everything works, then I don't think you're trying hard enough sometimes, you know, to push the boundaries. And then there's the rule book as well. You, you kind of, you know, you've got to stay on the right side of the rule book whilst reading between the lines as well. But, you know, you'll, you'll be familiar with that. I'm sure. Well, I mean, when I hear that, it tells me it's like, you know, don't beat yourself, but is it safer to stay with the status quo or is it just like in our business, every now and then you got to step over that line to be well, able you to do. find I out mean, keep moving I, it down the, down the road? I think staying with the status quo, yeah, for sure, that's safe, 100%. That is the safest route you're ever going to take. But someone else is going to step over the line if you don't, at which point the, the status quo is reset. So maybe it's nice to be up at the sharp end and – Sometimes it's a good thing where you get overtaken because then, you know, you get a bit more motivation as well at times. Um, and it comes down to a healthy respect between competitors as well. Right. Well, the, you know, one thing I was, you know, doing some studying on the on, on DSPS and I love two things that's on your, your front page. Do it once and do it properly. But also zero defect and that's that's a pretty that's a pretty bold statement but i yeah. don't think you make these statements unless you can back them up is okay. that correct it is to talk about the first thing you know do it once and do it properly everyone claims you know people don't seem to have the money to do it properly the first time but they always seem to find the funds to do it a second and a third time to get it right and you think well, well you know, it's a balancing act. What happens if you did it right the first time? The zero defects, not everything we make is perfect. That's a fact. But everything we send out the door, we like that to be perfect. So okay, and that, that's what the, yeah, that's what the zero defects is. It, it's not everything we make is perfect because it's not. We make mistakes. We're a human. But everything that goes to a customer, yeah, that's been through a lot of testing, a lot of checking. A lot of inspection so i kind of take it personally when something goes out to the customer that's not exactly as it should be and 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 that's something i think that i can totally respect about the fact that you you're willing to put this in print and stand behind it it it, it shows me that you know there there's a level of integrity it's important to your organization. Not only do you believe in making a better product, but if there's something wrong with the product, you know, it's, you're going to stand behind it. But more importantly, you don't feel like there's any, any defects there when it goes out the door because you're that confident about it. And I, anybody that's ever been involved in anything across, across the board, folks, just so you make sure we're not trying to put these people in a corner. We're not trying to put DSPS or Penny Perry in a corner, but, I love the fact you're willing to be that bold about it and that confident about it. I think that's impressive. Thank you. You know, we try. Um, everyone who works here, you know, has been at the shop in the motorsports for a long time. And, you know, the worst thing you can do is stop a car. You know, a car can have an, a crash. A car can have an accident. There's nothing you can do about that. But if your component fails and that stops the car, that's like, that's, there's nothing worse than that. And once upon a time in 1985 at Indy, we managed to stop the entire grid. And because we 
seriously, there was we had a new design of waste gates and we rushed the design of the membrane through and it just wasn't up to the job. And during qualifying and practice, everyone stopped. And it was humbling, terrifying, and also like a revelation. And that's what's driven our passion and obsession with quality ever since. So, you know, from failure come come good results. And, and there again, like I say, you learn lessons the hard way. And I guess that's one of the reasons why you can feel like you're that confident today, because you have had the most catastrophic failure that anybody can have in a situation like that. But yet you rebounded. You know, you're still here today, better and stronger than probably ever before. Uh, with, with all this being said, what's the price of quality? I mean, how do you how do you put a dollar figure on it? How how does how do you explain a dollar figure that you have for a product? Because again, to have the best, I mean, you've got to get the best, and sometimes getting the best is not what you call um, cheap. It's there's a difference between cheap and inexpensive. Um, inexpensive is okay, cheap is not, but. Right. How do you put a dollar value? You know, you can have a um, here's a here's a here's a gate. This is one of our classic gates. It's about, I guess, two thousand dollars in you know, in U.S. dollars. If that stops, okay, that's a damage to our reputation. But there's all the other sponsors and all the other comp you know all the other sponsors on that car. Nothing to do with us, but their investment is is compromised as well. How do you put a dollar value on that? And then what about the reputation of the driver? You know, it's going to be, oh, you stopped again or whatever the case might be. So it is a big responsibility to anyone who supplies um, critical parts to race cars because it's not just that part failing. It's it's the whole show. It's the whole presentation. You know, this is all about marketing yeah. at the end of the day. And, you know, cars are mobile billboards and, you know, promoting products and if they were to stop, that that stops a lot of a lot of things for a lot of folks. So I, I don't know how you put a price on failure, but the, the price of quality is wow. Yeah, it's very difficult to quantify. Um, you know, the second you put integrity and reputation into that, yeah, then that just goes through the roof. So all you can do is the best that you can do every day. And and when there's a failure, then then you own it. You you have to. You know that is. I think total ownership is the only way to to do any of this stuff. And when there's you know it's if you have a team of people, when you do well, everyone does well. When you do badly, then that's me doing badly. You know the team are only doing what I'm telling them to do. So yeah, that's that's the way we that's the way we work. And so far, it's been okay. I would say so. I think your product represents that kind of, um, I call it tenacity. And at the same time, you know, knowing how to do the things you have to do behind the scenes to feel confident about what you're getting ready to do in front of the, the scene, you might say. Yeah, and sure. That's putting it out front and putting it through its paces and, and letting the whole world see this is our end product. And here's our end result. And I think you know, your record speaks very loudly in that area. And uh, I think that's pretty cool. I mean, I, I admire uh, what you guys have accomplished and what you do, you know, week in and week out uh, to continue to move the needle and, and chase that ever uh, uh, elusive tenth of a second that everybody's looking for. <laughs> I'll be happy with a thousandth of a second. I have to be okay. honest. Okay. Okay. Well said, and to, and and I agree with that. I would. But take I mean, a you, you know, you right you've, now. you you've done this, and you know, everything you do, it's it's on TV. It's it's instant, and with social media as it is now, you, yeah, everything you do is very public and very obvious. So, mm -hmm. yeah, as they like to say, somebody's going to call somebody out if something's wrong. You know? <laughs> Yeah, that's the whole thing. Somebody's take look looking for uh, 
some kind of, I guess, I guess you might say they smell blood in the water, so they want to come come and get a little bit. Um, so Perry, sure. like I said, what what uh, what have you got for us today? I'd love to see you know what the, some of the latest innovations are. I'll talk you through. Um, it's talking you through how we ended up where we are today, um, mm -hmm. and what what drove us to get there. And then I'm I'm happy for you to interrupt at any time if you you know if you want or there's a burning question, but I'll I'll leave that to your discretion. Okay, sir. I appreciate that. Thank you. So Thank you. I'm going to try and share my screen and let's see how we go. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? I see you. You're oh, there it is. There it is. Yeah. Optimize it optimizing boost control the new era of wastegates and technology yeah perfect Th thank you for you know giving the title that's brilliant that's one less thing i have to do today <laughs> so we'll start from the beginning um we've all had um you know traditional wastegates controlled by a spring in a membrane um and they were fairly dumb animals you know you'd get to a certain boost level and they'd open then you know, at some point we introduced a position sensor and it was one of these weird things. We put the sensor on and we knew we could sense when the wastegate was open or closed, but we couldn't do much else. And after a few years, we moved on to a linear position sensor. And that was as a result of a lesson from Formula One, but I'll come back to that. And then of course, what next? You know, the future is open for anybody. This is the old, this is the workhorse, the workhorse of DSPS um, mm -hmm. technology, which is the DW1 wastegate introduced in the 80s. Basic technology, we've sold thousands of these over the years. Um, to this day, we still sell um, loads of them. They're very, uh, very robust, used a lot on rally cross cars today. Um, one or two hyper cars use a version of them. So really, Good old fashioned engineering, but very, very high quality using mnemonic forged valves, Inconel castings and um, titanium valve guide housings. Everything to uh, tolerate heat and radiate heat, get lot, you know, and just mm -hmm. good, good quality. Um, particular animal in the early days of Le Mans, happily completed Le Mans without any issues at all. So this is the beginning of the story. And after a little while in the early or late 90s, we decided to see if we could put a position sensor on it. So we had a very, very basic sensor, just a Hall effect sensor and a magnet. And you can see the curve is not very linear. So, you know, to do any control on something like that would be difficult at best, especially considering every sensor had a very slightly different curve, same shape, but different curve. So, this was fine and we ended up using quite a lot of these sensors, but teams would use them to more as um, reassurance that their gate was either open or closed because the start and end numbers were much the same. It's what happened in the middle. That was always a little bit of a surprise in the variable. So it was used as reassurance more than, than anything else, but not as a means of control. Um, and this is, the same wastegate, but you know, the DW1 wastegate, but with the position sensor. So once again, lots of them used, um, but it was a nice to have. Then we became in, uh, involved in, in F1. Um, I can't say the customer, but F1 is a different beast. And now, now there's a cost cap and money is important, but there was a time when all they needed was the best with cost being secondary. So we had um, an F1 wastegate, which tends to be hydraulic. Stroke is 10 to 15 millimeters. And you can go from closed to fully open in less than 10 milliseconds. I mean, it's pretty, pretty rapid. The scary thing is you could control this. So imagine being able to control, you know, your wastegate to anywhere, you know, you could flutter it between one and two millimeters at a frequency of, you know, 300 Hertz. And you could do that. And that, that was magic because that opened the door to a revelation. The top curve is just a standard sinusoidal curve. And 
that approximates a traditional wastegate. You know, you'd get up to a boost level, the wastegate would open and your pressure would drop. And then you'd have to build the pressure up again. And so you would go up and down and up and down. With the hydraulic one, we could kind of operate. Can you see there's a line, there's a blue line. Let's say that's our nominal boost level. We could operate very, very fast, just around about that line. So we could maintain, let's say we're talking about four bar of boost. I know that's our four bar, that's about 60 PSI, 60 pounds of boost. That's serious boost, but that's kind of F1 territory at the moment. Now, if you were off the traditional gate, you'd get to 60 pounds of boost, the gate would open and you'd drop down to 30 pounds. That's a bit dull because then you've got a whole turbo lag thing to get hold of, get over again. But if you could oscillate just under the 60 pounds of boost, opening and closing your wastegate, only a little bit, all of a sudden you can maintain a very, very high level of boost for a really long time. So that's achievable. We've done it. It's operating now, but it's really, really expensive. And um, a lot of series in the world, look at, look at IndyCar. It's phenomenal competition. Um, you know, reasonable budgets, but really small compared to F1, but the racing is amazing. So what are they doing? They're doing something right. So it's mm -hmm. how can we get this style, this F1 style of control into a standard gate? That, that was our aim. So we sort of th started thinking, well, you know, could we have pneumatic control? It's difficult to control very well. So we, we started exploring an electronic gate was the first thing we had to look at. There's a German wastegate actuator called Megaline. Um, and this was our very first exploration. So we took our workhorse wastegate, DW1, and we grafted this actuator on the top of it. And you can see, it looks, looks very nice. However, temperature, temperature is an issue. It's electronic. You know, we, we, we're trying to get the package as small as possible. And, you know, we were struggling a little bit, to be honest. So we, we devised um, a water-cooled version of our um, gate. Um, this in my hands, oh, you can't see actually, I'll, I'll come back to that later. But okay. the water-cooled version, that, that just kept everything a little bit cool around, around the actuator. And that was okay. It worked, it was quite pricey, a little bit heavy. So we set about developing our own version of a, you know, electronic wastegate. And it had some very nice machine parts, but we, it just wasn't doing it for us. Getting it to, you know, control it, we just used um, a, a brushless stepper motor, getting it to do what we wanted, it, it, it wasn't right. We could get it to do what we wanted, but nowhere near the speed. And that's, that's no good either. So we thought, well, what happens if we develop a linear sensor? Now you remember the original sensor was kind of a weird curve. So with some of the lessons from F1, we, we developed a little sensor. You can see it in the top right hand, top right hand of each picture. And that just grafted onto a standard cap, which would fit onto our existing DW1 wastegate. You see, it's coming back, this, this old workhorse. It's quite something. And all of a sudden the curve we're getting it's a lot more linear and not only is it's linear from say two degrees to you know two two millimeters to 16 millimeters or um, five eighths of an inch so we're getting pretty linear travel over five eighths of an inch that's this is this is a big step from where we were we had quite a play with magnets um samarium cobalt is the the green magnet and it it's a slightly shallower curve than neodymium so our first impression was, yeah, let's go near Dimium. That's the way to go. You know, the, the steeper the curve, the better. The problem is once you get to 100 degrees Celsius, the neodymium kind of drops away. The samarium cobalt, on the other hand, is good to 300 degrees Celsius. So since we, we discovered that, we've been using samarium cobalt magnets for all our sensors in, in F1, in um Rallycross, um, some of our IndyCar gates were using samarium components. It's 
everything we can just to maintain reliability and uniformity at elevated temperatures. No one wants to get anywhere near 300 degrees Celsius, but, you know, lots of other things are going to fail, but the sensor will keep on working. But, you know, that's just me being flippant, to be honest. So armed with this linear sensor that we're now a lot more confident in, we thought, can we apply this to a standard pneumatic control? You know, this would be heaven if we could do this. So we set up an Arduino, really, really basic little control system using open loop control. And then we used the valve position and our sensor for feedback, which then moved on to closed loop control. And then the plan was to switch to using proportional pneumatic valves and proportional control. And finally, full PID. And, you know, these were some of the, the traces we had for pressure and um, displacement. And the thing we found is from peak to peak, as we increased the pressure of the system, you know, the, the distances became, became smaller. So this was actually quite, quite a, good, a good move for us. And using once again, now the blue line is the target, we, the demand signal we're aiming for. But with pneumatic control, we still, it's not bad. We're, we're oscillating around where we want to be. So from that point of view, we accomplished a big step. You know, we're not having huge changes in amplitude, but it's still plus or minus a millimeter. And that's that's not that cool, really. Um, you know, we, we would still be seeing fluctuations in pressure, which weren't ideal for us. So we thought, well, we've made a gain, but nothing we're going to offer any customer. So and this, this comes down to the thing, you know, we've had failures in the shop, but they don't they don't leave here. So I'm happy to talk about them now, but at the time, yeah, different matter. So we thought, all right, how are we going to move this forwards? So we wanted, we drew up a list of specifications. This is, this was the ideal that we wanted for a affordable, and I stress, affordable control system. Mm -hmm. We wanted axial movement of 20 millimeters to provide an, an axial load of 500 newtons, um, what's that, 50 kilos, say 100 pounds. Um, we wanted to sustain, be able to hold it in any position indefinitely. So if we found a position we liked, be it for pressure modulation, then we could hold it there. It wasn't on a spring. We wanted to deliver a, a linear speed, you know, 100 millimeters per second or say four inches per second. That's the speed we were were aiming for. We needed a means of sensing where the valve was, and we had a target mass of a pound, say half a kilo. This was for the actuator. Um, we needed a means for monitoring actuator temperature. This is critical, mainly from because of the electronics that were going to be housed in inside. We wanted a mechanical interface with a valve, preferably, you guessed it, the DW1 valve. And um, we want to be able to operate round about 240 degrees centigrade. We had a packaging volume to aim, but that's kind of nominal. And we wanted to be able to achieve half a million cycles. These were just some you know, notes we put down on a piece of paper. Then from an electronic point of view, we needed to be able to say, well, you know, what's going to interface with most race car systems these days, CAN or PWM? Um, we needed to supply three phase electrical power. We wanted to have brushless DC motors. And then it had to operate in a 12 volt bus. You know, we had to provide something that was special, new, but that you could offer to anybody that then they didn't need to buy loads of extra equipment. That's not how what we we're about. Um, we needed indication of fault conditions, over current, over temperature. And we wanted to operate, you know, um, on a closed feedback loop. We need to monitor control electronics and provide, provide a means of calibrating fully open and fully closed for the wastegate. So we set ourselves some pretty serious tasks. And then we you know, created a, a 1D mathematical model to support, to support all of this. Um, we derived the nominal force displacement curve, which was undertaken using a bunch of 
assumptions, which we'll describe uh, on the next slide. And you know the model is based on the assumptions that um, performance calculations included motor torque profiles, inertias, and friction components. It's really difficult to get a lot of this this information from um, motor manufacturers, and I, I get that. So we we tend to form very close relationships with um, engine manufacturers. Um, we never treat anyone as a customer. We always treat them as partners because we're providing them with our components and we want to know how they get on. We want to know how they perform, you know, and if we're letting a customer down, we want to know, we want to make, you know, rem remedy that. We wanted to achieve our 20 millimeters of stroke in 0.1 of a second. So hundred milliseconds. This is an order of magnitude slower than F1. But that's okay. I can live with that. That's still pretty acceptable for a, you know, when compared to a pneumatic valve, a pneumatic wastegate. Um, our initial assumptions and predictions predicted around about 0.12 of a seconds for the 20 millimeters. We thought that that's a good a good starting point. And then we'd have to uh, test the system to verify performance. You know. And verifying stuff in the lab is one thing. You know, it's test rig, it's nice conditions, there's there's coffee in the corner, it's not cold outside, or it's not boiling hot outside. Either way, it's the lab is great, but it's an unreal world. So we formed a, a partnership with um, an engine manufacturer, someone we've been working with for years, and they agreed to, you know, do some of the heavy lifting from a testing point of view. Um, they provided some sample data. I can't um, say who they are, I'm sure you understand. But they provided some sample data, very generic, that we could use for our, our simulations. And, um, you know, we derived some valve, valve force versus valve lift curve at wide open throttle, 10,000 revs. And this is all theoretical still. So, you know, on a piece of paper, it looks brilliant and everyone's happy. But then you've got to build this, and you know, is it going to work? So we ended up. You can see the base of this picture. It's our famous favorite DW1 throttle. So we did. We designed something that would bolt bolt straight on. And I've got some hardware to show you afterwards. You can see there's the can, you know, can bus. We're trying to use as many um, common connectors so that once again you don't have to go purchase, you know, special special stuff. Electrical parameters, you know, we wanted maximum to minimum voltage, 18 volts, 6 volts, um, with a nominal of 14.4 volts. Once again, nothing nothing special. Um, we were aiming for a nominal current of 6 to 8 amps. Once again, it's not scary for anyone. And DC peak current of about 20 amps, but for a really, really short period of time. Initially, it was going a bit higher than that, and we thought, yeah, that's going to cause spikes, which are going to cause a problem. So somehow, with some uh, clever electronics, we brought that back. And this is what we came up with. So it's a little bit taller than a standard wastegate, but and it's um, a project we, we did together with a company in the UK called Primo Engineering. Um, we work on them on a bunch of stuff, um, a lot of gear design, they are excellent at what they do. And um, they've designed some of the internals of the actuator from an electronic point of view. So good bunch of guys, and uh, it's a growing company. And then we we devised the test rig, you know, how do you simulate what a, a wastegate sees? We can do it from a load point of view, that's quite easy. But in the workshop, there's no, there's no temperature, you know, that's gonna cause us, um, any real problem and that's the problem we actually want to cause problems we want high temperature so i mean you can see there's a lot of fins on these a lot of to to dissipate heat um the valve guide housing is always titanium it always has been titanium um there are a couple of race series in japan and they run something called super gt uh, titanium is banned on grounds of cost so that's then stainless steel and it works just as well. Um, heat, you know, heat values are a little bit higher, but 
for what we're doing here, it had to be titanium. We wanted to give it the best, best shot. From a current requirement, you can see this is actually on, on the test bench. And you can see we're kind of nominally hovering around about six amps most of the time with excursions to 12 amps when there's particularly high demand on speed of speed of actuation. And we tried all sorts of time and displacement things. How can we, um, you know, with target figures given by the engine manufacturer, it's how do we achieve these speeds? And some of them were huge. Some of the speeds were massive, more than 500 millimeters per second. You know, this is as, as a peak. So we tried dialing it back a little bit and we tried various um, ways of modifying um, our software. And mm -hmm. essentially the results were good. So we based everything on real data. It, it's important, you know, if we're gonna give someone a product that it will be able to do what they want it to do. Um, we logged all our data at 100 Hertz for this particular, and the duration of data was 68 and a half seconds. So it was quite a good, quite a good um, sample. But as you can see, some of the peak speeds were, you know, 730, 866 millimeters per second. This is huge, way more than the 100 millimeters per second that we had set as our peak. As it happens, we achieved not bad numbers, you know, but very, very happy with the results. So, and that's kind of where we're at. We've managed to get to that um, aim of hovering around an imaginary line just below the boost limit, just below where your wastegate wants to crack open. So we're maintaining a really high level of boost for a really, really long period of time. I'm gonna switch my screen off here. So go back okay. to me. Um, he says, how do I do that? Um, video, no. stop share, there we go, right. There we go. So this is our standard BW1 wastegate. So mm -hmm. super, super popular. And this is the, you know, electronic version. So it's a little bit taller. It's actually a little bit lighter, believe it or not. Um, and there's also some trick components in here. The DW1 uses a forged valve. So very tough, very excellent. What we've done, and I don't know if you can see, you might be able to, there's a floating valve inside there. So right. when things get really hot, particularly now with a lot of laser sintered housings, as everything expands, the valve seat moves as well. And very often it's not entirely concentric, which means if you have a static valve, which you try and close, the valve tries to bend. That's not, that's not great. So by having a, a little floating valve, it allows for misalignment of up to 40 thou, and it can float in any direction, still sealing. So on, on a standard DW1 casting, that's not a problem. But if a lot of um, exhaust systems these days are grown, you know, we're using a laser sintering process, and then that tends to expand in unpredictable, unpredictable ways. So we're quite proud of this. Um, it's a it's a technology we actually developed for use with Volkswagen in rally cars about 20 years ago, 25 years ago actually. And we thought maybe it's time to wheel that one out again and see if we can give you know breathe more life into that particular idea. So here's hoping. And that's that's us in a in a nutshell. You know, it's all about moving air, controlling air, and keeping it operating at a, a high temperature. I've got a question about. I understand everything you're you were driving, trying to get, to strive for. Which, when you're at that level, is so finite. It's like you say that one one thousandth versus the one 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 yeah a tenth. Yeah. What I'm I'm interested about when you got it to that point and you put it in that race car and put the driver in there, what were their responses? You know, what what was kind of like, you know, because to me that's the final deal. Is it, does it show up on the stopwatch and can a driver feel it? 
Uh, yes and yes, because when 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 we're operating, you know, at high levels of boost, and and it's say you're operating at 60, 60 pounds of boost on the standard waste gates, when that opens, your boost level plummets, and you think, oh, that's a problem. We've got to build that boost up again. So you put your foot down, and generally turbo lag is an issue. When you're operating at just below that 60 pounds and you can keep it there, all of a sudden you don't have any fluctuations in boost. It's just a continual band of power all the time. So yeah, the driver feels it. If you're going through a turn, the car isn't unsettled due to a, a drop in boost. You know, you're maintaining um, a constant power curve. So yeah, the driver absolutely feels it. Um, mm -hmm. We do a bunch of anti-lag valves or fresh air valves. And it's quite interesting because this little, this little thing, which is about an inch and a quarter there, um, you know, that will be off throttle. You would still provide cold air or fresh air um, into the exhaust system, which would spool the, the, the turbine up and you minimize lag that way. And that was fine. That was off a world rally car. But as time has progressed and turbos have gotten ever bigger, the requirement to move more air, I mean, this is our standard anti-lag valve now, and that's that's an inch and three quarters gone up from an inch and just over an inch. That That's a massive increase. So right. everything we can do to make the driver not feel when the gate is, you know, opened, then that's, we're doing a good job if, if that's the case. So yes, the driver can absolutely feel it. And it does show on the stopwatch. Well, and again, if we're, you've got it down where it's almost like, I think it's incredible the, 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 what you've been able to do as far as make that uh, the linear line that you were looking for and the response and everything mm -hmm. come together. So, I mean, it's like, I don't know if you say blinking eye or, or, or I don't know. I mean, how do you measure what you guys have gotten down to and how could you make it any better? I mean, I guess that would be the next question is, is that the next challenge we want to do, we want to, we want to get to that. We want to get that point two off of there. We want to be under that. Is that, would that be possible? I think it is possible, but the problem is as you get better and you operate at a higher level, okay, let's say we can run the engine at a higher boost level for longer. Mm -hmm. There's going to be another component somewhere in the system that's not that happy operating at that level so yeah. someone else another manufacturer is going to have to go oh we need, we need to improve our component you know and it's a, a stepwise process and that's why i say yeah. everyone works together i guess so you know you look at athletes in the olympic games and you, you let's look at the 100 meters and you always ask how fast can they go can they get another hundred or thousandth of a second and they do i don't know how but they do and if, if we didn't think we could always find that little bit extra, well, this whole industry would just stop. Everyone wants to find that little bit. So, and it's there. The thing is, the technology only takes you so far. It's the driver that always takes you the rest of the way. Yeah. You know, just that little bit of self-belief. Yeah, how do you, I, I'm, I'm in awe of what they do sometimes, genuinely. Well, I mean, in my in my thought process, and that's one of the reasons why I asked you about the driver uh, and, and the stopwatch, because to me, that's where I know, okay, we made it better, all right? Yeah. But now, all of a sudden, uh, the driver's doing this, and we've now got a loose condition because we've got power down quicker. Yeah, we're we going faster than to, we have. You know what I'm saying? The, the, everything pushes everything, as you said already. Uh, yeah. on down the hill and so whatever pickup you do here what does it create later i mean it's not just one corner you're trying to nav navigate there's multiple corners and the straightaways they all tie in together so now we got to work on our setup or change something in our aero package we know i mean i know you know where i'm coming from it's, oh, and that's I, part I, of the game. I know exactly it's part of the game yeah and you know that's the true essence of a team you know the driver does whatever he does, and ultimately that's the world sees that. The world doesn't see the rest of the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, but everyone is pushing everyone else as well. And right. 
yeah, you know, it's an amazing sport, actually. It doesn't look like a team sport, but it is. It really is. Well, I think I think that's part of what the, the, the magic and the missing parts, and this is part of what the reason what webinars are so good about, is that, yeah, we can talk about drivers and results and everything like that all day long, but how do they achieve that? How do you achieve greatness without having the best and the quality and the technology that goes into the program as a whole to give you the end result? And also what is mind boggling is that your your company and your in and, and the people you work with, and no matter what series it is, there's other competitors out there that are trying to do the same thing you are. And we yeah. go back to one of the questions early on, is it the competitor or is it the customer? And end game is you guys aren't quitting because there's there's still something to gain. And so come and get us if you can. It's exactly that, you know. Maybe it all comes down to respect, you know. You've got to respect your competitor. You've got to respect yes. um, your customer. Um, healthy respect. Never fear, but always respect. And that that I think seems that's a great to work quite well. It. Yeah. Yep. What do you think, Francis? I think that's the way it needs to be. Absolutely. I've, I've known Perry for 20 plus years or so. Um, and I've always been amazed. Uh, he's a brilliant mind. And I you know watched him build the SPS from the ground up. And uh, I'm so glad we had to reschedule. It was uh, scheduled earlier this year, but it travels everywhere in the world. You know, every time I send a message is in Japan or in the States or around the globe, uh, you know, dealing with his customers. And uh, it's a brilliant company. And I'm, I'm so glad uh, we were able to... Uh, to, to have him share his expertise with us today. So thank you very much, Perry. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Jeff, thank as you. always. Judy, this, Jeff. Is, the, this webinar has been recorded. It will be posted later on the Portrait platform, distributed through our newsletter, social media channel. And uh, for more information and updates, please visit ePortrait.com. We also push the SPS product back on the homepage there. Next week will be our last episode of the season, and we're going to be talking with Peak. So again, thank you very much, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, guys. ePart Trade is a digital platform that we've created basically to make life easier in the business community of auto racing. ePart Trade, there is no e-commerce. It's literally a connection just like at a trade show. So now, any time of the year, a buyer could reach out to a supplier. When you see a product that you're interested in, all you need to do is click on the request more information and then from there it is forwarded directly to the buyer or to the supplier. ePartrade really eliminates having to travel, closing down your shop. Now you have a place to showcase globally your racing product and technology. Land speed record holder George Poteet's speed demon rocketed 481 miles per hour at the Bonneville Salt Flats. You don't go that fast without ARP fasteners. There is no way that we could go the speed that we've gone, the number of times we've gone, with a lesser quality bolt than ARP supplies to us. And we absolutely wouldn't be where we were today if it weren't for ARP. When failure is not an option, it's ARP-Bolts.com. We're Performance Plus Global Logistics. Our team of dedicated performance industry and logistics experts get valuable cars and components to the track on time in top condition. We provide expedited logistics solutions for the performance industry using direct routes instead of deferred options and communicate all necessary information to the appropriate resources to meet regulations and ensure a smooth transit and secure delivery, both domestically and internationally. And we exceed customer expectations by providing best-in-class service with an efficient and cost-effective system in place. Contact us today to book your next shipment. You work as hard as your truck, and you have no time for downtime. That's why more truck owners trust Blue Def, America's number one diesel exhaust fluid brand. Each batch is guaranteed pure, so you can avoid costly repairs caused by inferior death. Demand America's best for your truck. Blue Def and Blue Def Platinum. Put trust in your truck. Roots in the Midwest that date back well before the Model T. Fifth Third Bank has a long history of serving the needs of automotive companies. 
While much has changed over the years, our passion for helping businesses put cars on the road and on the track has not. Today, we are more committed than ever as a member of SEMA, a founding member of PRI, and a sponsor of multiple race teams across several racing series. For over a decade, Fifth Third Bank has been a staunch supporter of our industry and a great partner for many companies in the motorsports field. Our business has been growing extremely fast, and really, we could not be where we are today without Fifth Third. They provided amazing strategic advice, the capital we need to support our phase of the group. They are true partners for me now, and what they do with their involvement in motorsports is untouched in this community. Where can we take your business? Fifth Third Bank. Where will you find Ferreira Racing Components? Circle Track, Drag Racing, and any top race shop. In every form of motorsports competition, our valves and valve train components deliver race-proven design and technology. And we've brought that same performance to our street applications as well. We're backed by five decades of experience, an extensive range of off-the-shelf components, and our custom valve department has the fastest turnaround times in the industry. Ferreira Racing Components. Stand with us or race against us. When it comes to pushing the limits of performance, the pros know there's no room for compromise. At Crower Cams, we don't just engineer camshafts and valve train components, we redefine what power means. Since 1955, Crower Cams has been the name trusted by racers, engine builders, and gearheads around the globe. Whether you're building a street machine, a dragster, or a track car, Crower Cams provides the muscle you need to dominate. And with Crower, victory is within your reach. Scribner Plastics has provided professional strength shipping containers to the automotive and performance industry for over 40 years. We have containers that will fit most any configuration of complete or partial engines and transmissions. Today we highlight part number 5148 cylinder head shipping and storage container. Base has double wall durable construction featuring a cinch strap with an abrasion sleeve that securely fits your small block, big block, and pro stock heads to the base at all times. Talk to your dealers and distributors about the shipping storage container for cylinder heads from Scrimmer Plastics, part number 5148.